Welcome everybody to today's uh, VitaFast webinar. The topic of today is how to improve booth health by nutritional solutions. My name is uh, Jan Storgård and I'm a technical advisor in VitaFast. So a couple of weeks ago, we also had a webinar also focusing on hoof health, hoof problems. This time though, it was the environmentally induced uh, hoof diseases, hoof infections, like for instance, Dicotel dermatitis. Also on this webinar, we presented our product Hoofus that shows very promising results in controlling Dicotel dermatitis. So if you haven't seen that uh, webinar yet, I recommend you to go to our homepage where you can get access to, to, uh, to the video from this uh, webinar. It, it gives you a very nice and practical introduction to the product, how to use it, what to expect, and what to avoid. Okay, coming back to today's uh, webinar, as mentioned, who self and nutrition is the focus. Today's uh, presentation will be given by my colleague uh, and hoof specialist, Felisto Dumitrov. He will talk about hoof problems in general related to nutrition. And then afterwards, my colleague and nutritionist, uh, Stephanie Briede, will go into details about uh, trace elements, like for instance, manganese, zinc, and copper, and in relation with hoof health. And finally, she will, will give you a short introduction to our product, uh, Marathon. During this uh, webinar, it's uh, possible to ask a question in the chat. And of course, we will follow up on those uh, questions with answers afterwards. This uh, session here will be recorded uh, and we will send you this uh, video along with the presentations uh, afterwards. Uh, if there is no objections to this recording, we will take this as an approval. So everybody, please enjoy the webinar and Felisto, the word is yours. Thank you, uh, Jan, for your kindly introduction. Um, we will present uh, on this webinar how to improve hoof health by nutritional solutions. I will start with my presentation right now. Uh, nutritional approaches to minimize lameness in dairy cattle. Uh, in um, our topics for today are Roman Balancing Act, nutritional considerations, nutritional uh, variable affecting room and pH, role of digital cushion, and uh, supercoot ruminal acidosis, so-called SARA, and the effect on lameness. On the first slide, I want to, to present you the Rumen Balancing Act, which means we need to find the balance between the physical fiber effect the, the, phys the physical fibers and the carbohydrates. Uh, if we don't have these balance, we uh, see many uh, problems into our cows. So uh, it's better to balance our rations uh, uh, when it's going through the lameness uh, problems. Nutritional consideration, um, most of the minerals, um, vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids components um, on the feeding rations are involved into the formulating the, the hoof horn and the area into the claws. Um, most important uh, element, it's biotin. Uh, he's the major. Uh, element who uh, it's recommended uh, around 50 to 20 milligrams per cow per day. Um, so our cows need uh, biotin um, all them life. So uh, when we have decreased uh, that levels of biotin, uh, we see a lot of diseases appear into, into the claws. So the function uh, of biotin, it's to improve the hoof health and uh, also reducing the lameness. Uh, nutritional factors contributing to pH load in the rumen are, in that case, uh, we see a difference between the, the rations, uh, as we know around the world, 
for instance, uh, in Denmark, um, uh, they fed cows 60% uh, uh, high forages and 40% higher grains. And if we uh, take on the consideration uh, Israel, they are uh, feeding 50% or 60% higher grains and 40% uh, higher forages. So uh, that means when we increase the higher grain uh, content into the TMR ration, uh, we uh, decreasing the level of the pH. So then we uh, have a lot of problems uh, with the Roman function. And then this is also related uh, to the lameness problem. Nutritional variable effect in uh, affecting rumen pH, it's also uh, specific periods into the cow's life. Um, so, for example, postpartum and prepartum period, uh, as we know from Professor Mike Hutchins, uh, we have to recommend uh, at least uh, two uh, dry groups, uh, far off, so call them, and close up. And then we have to get um, a fresh group. That means these uh, negative energy balance between the dry period and the lactation period in the, into the cow, uh, we have to solve that uh, um, problem with uh, some kind of regulation into the rations. So, uh, the, as we know, the, the natural uh, buffer for the rumen, it's uh, rumination load index, the, the rumen load index. So, for example, we need to have around uh, 450 minutes per day, at least, to have uh, a, a, rumination, a rumination into our animals. That then produ we produce uh, a saliva, which is very healthy and it's natural buffer for, for the rumen. Um, when we increase the, the, higher, the higher content of uh, higher grains and um, also uh, a fermentation um, feed into our ration, then we see uh, a very dramatically decreasing of the rumen pH. In that case, uh, uh, we see the decreasing uh, the pH and then we kill a lot of the good bacteria uh, into the rumen, which are responsible for digest the, nu the, the nutrients. Uh, so we, when we have increasing the higher grains, uh, we have these acidosis. Another um, scientific proof also uh, is uh, that the absorption of histamine and antidoxin, when we have a higher grain content TMR rations, uh, we are make damage on the, on the microflora into the rumen. So as you can see here on that picture, these are the popular of uh, the higher grains and these are into the rumen and these are high popular of the higher forages uh, rations. So we need to, to take care of the rumen um, healthy, healthy, healthiness uh, very, very, uh, very good because uh, when we have a SARA or so-called uh, super good ruminal acidosis, we see that damage, we make that damage on the papilla into the rumen. One of the solutions are to uh, just examine how, what we feed in uh, our, our cows. So Penn State particle separator, it's a very, very uh, nice tool to, to make uh, counting of the percent of the concentrate feed uh, into the ration normally. Uh, NCR uh, recommend uh, recommend 45% uh, uh, maximum on the content of the higher grain. So, which means if we have above 45%, uh, we have a higher risk of acidosis into our herd. Um, another tool to measure the, the, the acidosis into the, our herd, it's manure evaluation. 
as you can see on that picture, the FECAL score three, it's a perfect um, um, FECO because uh, we have uh, enough uh, digestions um, and, uh, and physical fiber into the ration. And, and we can see in the, the FECO score one, um, we absorb that uh, sometimes in the uh, in the prepartum period when the fresh cows are uh, having a higher content of the higher, higher grains uh, TMR rations. And it, normally we see the bubbles inside. So this is the clear sign when we have a, a clinical acidosis. So these also uh, could be um, very nice too to evaluate. And if we have the higher percent in our herd, uh, that, ki that kind of uh, fecal score, uh, we should uh, add more uh, fiber into our ration. What are uh, the nutritional related hoof disease? Uh, they are very common. Uh, as you can see on that picture, these are the sole ulcer, the sole hemorrhage and the white line abscess. So, so hemorrhage is very common. Uh, we see that disease uh, after one or two months when we uh, increasing the, the, the higher grain content into the TMR ration. Um, so loser is very common. It's also connected to the, the, to the digital cushion. I will explain you um, on the next slides. Uh, it's also uh, the white line abscess. Um, it's also related to the nutrition disease uh, when we increase the higher content, the, the higher forages, uh, when we increase the higher uh, grains into our TMR ration. Uh, another nutritional related hoof disorders are uh, vertical fissure, horizontal fissure and toe ulcer. So horizontal fissure and vertical fissure are very common for the beef uh, cattle industry. Uh, oh, we see that disease is also in the dairy um, uh, because if we uh, have dramatically um, changing the rations and not enough uh, elements, so for example, biotin or or zinc, um, we have uh, we see that kind of diseases uh, into our cows. And also, it's the one of the causes. It's the moisture inside the barns or outside uh, into the pasture. So these are very, very, uh, uh, how to say, huge problems. So if we have these kind of diseases, we can uh, solve the problem with uh, with minerals or some kind of changing. We have to change the rations. For example, in this claw here, as we know, the wall and from from the uh, grow up six months and then here it's around two months and a half. Uh, so uh, another solution is to add uh, minerals into our ration. So what is the role of digital cushion? Digital cushion, it's uh, quite very new for, for the scientific community and digital cushion, it's uh, act, it's act a, a, as a pump to blood out of the foot. Um, it's up here. Uh, it's uh, located between the distal phalanx, uh, as we know, the the last bone and the corium and, uh, and the hoof capsule. So it's uh, working as a bypass mechanism just to uh, decreasing the stress of the animal. And when we don't have uh, higher content and the higher energy content TMR rations, uh, in general, we have uh, see these uh, fat cushions are disappearing. So uh, if we decrease that uh, level of the digital uh, cushion, uh, then we have a uh, so hemorrhage disease, uh, white line disease, and also so loser. Uh, what is the another role of digital fat cushion, uh, the fat in digital cushion has high content of uh, monounsaturated fatty acid. It's called MUFA also. And uh, we see that fat cushions grow uh, up uh, completely on the second lactation 
of the life of the animal. So if we take on the consideration ep ep epidemiological study have uh, shown that uh, three is the higher tendency of the soul lesions uh, of the beginning of the first lactation. So in that means the heifers have significantly less fat, fat cushions, and they are having content of the saturated fatty acid, which means don't, they don't are too, they are not too heavy. So the, the organism of the cow, it's uh, not grow that fat cushions completely. So these are the pictures of the, the health tick hoof, as you can see here. Um, and you see the fat cushion, it's a uh, very healthy. Uh, it's in the normal diameter. And, it, and on the first picture, you can see here, um, this probably it's sole ulcer and the fat cushion, it's very thin, which means um, if we have a body condition score 2 or 2.5, uh, many, in many cases, uh, uh, we see the increasing of lameness into our herd. So we need to keep the body condition in the right, uh, right direction, 3.5. In this claw here, you can see a sole ulcer and also the sole hemorrhage. And you can see the different, just uh, completely different, uh, these two pictures. And in that, I want to uh, present you here the lameness prevalence. Uh, as, a, as I said, thin cow, lame cow, uh, if we have body condition, body condition score uh, less than two, we see increasing of the lameness prevalence up to 50%, almost 50%. And if we have uh, a body condition score 2.5, we see here uh, dramatically decreasing of that uh, uh, lameness prevalence. So if we keep our animals in, in the right condition, these uh, diseases, uh, they are not appear. And another um, factors, uh, hepatose, hepatize uh, of the effect of the lameness in dairy cattle. Lameness are the core of um, of the life of the animal. So if we have lameness, we have uh, uh, milk decreasing of the milk production, decreasing of the body condition score, uh, decreasing of the feed intake, uh, um, decreasing of the Dain milk. So the lameness are a very, uh, have a play the role in the life animal. So, uh, these are the, the connections between the lameness and the other factors. So always uh, work in good environment. Thank you for your attention. And I give the word to my colleague, uh, Stephanie Brete. Thank you. So I hope everyone can see my presentation. Thank you, uh, Christo, for your great presentation. At first, I want to say um, hello and welcome from my side. My name is Stefanie Briede, and I've been working for Willomix for around about three years. And um, now I want to go on with this uh, webinar and want to talk about trace elements on hoof stability. Uh, as we heard from Christo, it is very important that we have the right balance in the feed ration. And if we go more in detail, uh, we can go on with the word balance because we also have to choose the right balance of trace elements in our ration if we want to have a good hoof stability. At first, I want to give you uh, a short overview. I want to uh, introduce my presentation. 
Mm, at first, I want to talk about the effect of trace elements on who stability because um, it's uh, very important to understand why we have the topic of trace elements uh, if we talk about hoof stability. Afterwards, I want to go on and want to talk about the metabolism of trace elements in ruminants because it's very important to understand the metabolism of trace elements if you choose the right source of trace elements. Uh, after this point, I want to go on and want to show you what the difference are between the available trace element sources and uh, which kind of tools you have. At the end, I want to give you a solution approach from Veloforce and want to give a summary of our two presentations. If we talk about hoof stability, uh, and trace elements, we have to uh, look at three different trace elements. The most important trace elements for hoof stability are manganese, zinc and copper. Um, these three trace elements are very important because they all have different functions in the hoof. I want to start with manganese because manganese is a trace element which um, is needed for strong joints because uh, manganese is a part of the chondroitin sulfate which is needed to build up strong joints. Also manganese is very important for ligaments and bones. If I go to the to the next trace element I have to talk um, about zinc. As you all know Zinc is a very important trace element, not just for us humans, also for ruminants and for other animals. Zinc has um, a lot of uh, good and important functions in the body and uh, especially for the hoof stability. Zinc um, is needed for a good horn formation because zinc is a part um, of the building of carotene. Also, zinc is very important if we want to have a good wound healing. And this uh, second topic with the wound healing is a very important point nowadays if we are talk about problems uh, in the, in, at the hoof. The last trace element is copper because um, copper is needed for resilient uh, connective tissues because copper is um, a very big part of the building of collagen. Collagen um, is needed for this uh, connected tissues and also copper is included um, in the uh, building of an intact white line. At least um, the, the combination of zinc and copper is very important um, for the building of strong and, and, and an elastic sole horn, also from, uh, for a strong and elastic uh, heel bulb and for the wall horn. If I go on and uh, talk about the metabolism of trace elements in ruminants, then uh, we again have the word of balancing. We also hear this word uh, from, from Christo. He talked about the basic ration. If I talk about metabolism of trace elements in ruminants, then a very important word is the word homeostasis. Homeostasis comes from the Greek language and describes the maintenance of a stable state through internally regulated, regulating process as a self-regulating system. This means nothing more than the, than the animal tries to have the same content of a trace element in the blood all of the time. That means if we have a less content of a trace element in the blood, the animal tries right by the way to have um, a an, an very good content in the blood. This homeostasis depends on different points. At first, we have to say that the homeostasis depends on the species. So if we have a, a, a ruminant or a monogastric animal, then the homeostasis also depends on the supply situation. So that means um, which kind of amount we fed through the animal. The next point is the complex building components. That means if we have different components in the feed, for example, sulfur or, or molybdenum, then uh, we have two components which build a very strong complex, which is called t-molybdate. 
this um, complex um, bounds very strong to kappa so that the kappa is not available for the rumen for the for the animal in the rumen um, again we have um, the point with the trace element source so um, uh, by the point with the trace element source um, we can decide if we use organic or inorganic trace elements and at least we have the point with the dosage so that means uh, how much of which trace element we put in the animal no i will show you a picture of the metabolism of trace elements because um, as i said the animal tries to put the trace element in a homeostatic balance that means we have different kind of sources for example here in the picture it is zinc um, we have zinc from the feet that's are the the, blue, the the dark blue dots and we have um, zinc from the bile that means that zinc from the bile is zinc which goes from the intestine to the cell wall over the liver again back or the bile in the intestine. So we have two sources of, of different zinc components. If we have the homostatic balance, then everything is balanced. The zinc goes in the intestine and from the intestine to the cell. From the cell, a small amount of zinc goes over, over the kidney, out of the animal and a small part of zinc goes over the bile, again back through the intestine, and from the intestine, the zinc is excreted out with the feces. That means we have um, no stress from uh, deficiency or extremely oversupply. Um, the zinc is going just by the, norm by the normal transport system. This is uh, called in and efflux um, through, active, through active transport mechanisms out and in the cell. To give you a summary of this in words, I can say um, that uh, if we talk about the metabolism of trace elements, we have a resorption from trace elements in the small intestine. This saw we at the slide before on the topic. The trace elements are bound to specific protein transporters and were transported to the liver. So for example, zinc is bound through albumin and if it's bound through albumin, it goes through the liver. Then in the liver, the trace elements are bound again to different other metallotinine protein complexes. And there, um, as they are bound through metallotinine, they were stored in the liver. Also, um, they are put in enzymes and uh, at least they are excreted with the bile. I show you this on the picture before. Uh, this is the way um, how the thing goes over the bile again back in the intestine and who are excreted with the feces. Now we have two other ways of uh, the homeostatic status. We have uh, at first the oversupply. So this picture shows you what happens if we have an oversupply of zinc in the animal. As you see, we have a very high amount of zinc from the feet. This zinc from the feet goes uh, in the intestine and from the intestine in the cell. So no, the cell noticed that there's an oversupply of zinc. Um, because of this, the kidney reacts and more of the zinc goes out of the animal over the kidney. Also, the animal reacts and more of the zinc in the, in the cell goes over the liver through the bile and back again the intestine so that the animal tries to put out more zinc with the feces. That means um, the animal tries to reduce the active transport mechanisms and um, wants, to, uh, wants to try that not so much zinc goes from the intestine through the cell, but um, there's another unco uncontrolled passive uh, diffusion so that uh, something goes from the passive diffusion into the cell wall and the animal has to react. So um, as I showed before, we, have, uh, we had the situation of an oversupply and now we have uh, the other hand. We have the homeostatic situation 
um, in a deficiency situation. That means what does the animal do if we have uh, not so much of the needed trace elements in the intestine um, or in the blood. The animal tries to put more and more zinc from the intestine in the cell. This goes um, over the way that the animal um, absorbed it more of the thing by active transporters. So the active transporters which are putting the thing in the cell were built out more so that the animal has the choice to um, absorb more of this thing in the cell from the intestine. Um, also the kidney reacts and did not put out more zinc um, over, over, over the kidney. Also, the zinc which goes uh, back from the liver over the bile in the intestine um, is reduced so that we have less um, excretion from the zinc uh, over, over the feces and over the kidney. Now the question is, um, why can the animals get a shortage of trace elements because as we saw the animal tries all the time to have the right balance in the blood but there are some situations where not enough trace elements are there from the animal so that they cannot absorb enough of the trace elements. One of these reasons is the animal status because if we have a sick or a pregnant animals we have an increased demand. The next point is um, that we have different ingredients of the feed. As I told you before, we have uh, some ingredients in the feed, for example, sulfur and molybdenum. Um, and if we have too much from this both trace elements in the rumen, uh, this both trace element will build a very strong complex. This is called T molybdate. And this T-molybdate complex um, will go in a very strong uh, complex with copper so that this copper is not available for the animal and so the animal can have a shortage of copper. The next point is the status um, or the amount of different trace elements. It's not just that we can have um, trace elements from the feet, we can have also an overload of um, different trace elements. That means, for example, if we have too much iron in the feet, then we have an antagonistic effect through zinc and copper because iron and zinc and copper needed the same um, trace um, uh, metallotransporters um, for the way in the animal, in the cell. And if we have too much of this iron, then iron goes through the, through the transport mechanisms at first and copper and zinc were not absorbed by the animal or cannot absorb it by the animal. At least the last point is the quality and the processing form of the supplemented trace elements. What this means uh, will I show you on the next slides. Again, I want to come back through the antagonistic uh, interactions between set and trace elements because uh, I want to show you how important this topic is if we talk about trace elements. As you've seen, zinc has a lot of antagonistic effects with different trace elements. The important ones are the relationship to phosphor, to iron and to copper. For copper, um, we have um, a relationship uh, with zinc, with phosphorus and with, with iron again. For manganese, as I told you, we have a very strong effect to sulfur, molybdenum and also to phosphorus. So we cannot look just at one trace element. We have to look at um, the balance of all trace elements between each other because if we have a wrong calcium phosphor uh, uh, balance in the ration, this could include in, in include the, um, the absorption of other trace elements. To show you what happens if we have too much of one trace elements, I brought up this study. In this study, you can see that there was supplemented iron through beef cattle. 
in the first stadium, they did not put uh, any iron in the animal. And at the at the second trial, they put um, 400 milligrams per kilogram dry matter in the animal. And at least they took 1,600 milligram iron per kilo dry matter and put it in the feed ration of the of the animals of the beef cattle. And as you see, at first, if we put in 400 milligrams of the iron, the uh, amount of copper is reduced in the liver. You see it here on the left side. And if you now go on and put more iron in the ration of the beef cattle, then copper is reduced more then as we put in 400 grams and also the zinc reacts because zinc and copper cannot um, absorb any more by the animal because the um, transport mechanisms are used for the high amount of iron. So now is the question, what can we do? if we have a bad situation or a bad amount and less amount for any of, of the trace elements. As I told you, the inorganic trace element sources go through the uh, normal transport mechanism in the cell of the animal and from the cell of the animal in the blood over the liver. What choice do we have if we have an overload of, uh, for example, one trace elements, for example, um, iron, then we have just the chance that we use organic sources because organic sources are absorbed by a different uh, way in the, in, the, in the rumen or in the intestine. If we use an, an, an organic source, that means that our trace elements are not free in the intestine because they are bound on a protein. This could be a protein complex or a special amino acid. If we have the trace element bound on this um, protein, the, the animal noticed this trace element but does not absorb this um, trace element by the normal transport mechanisms because the animal just noticed that this is a protein. So this protein um, trace element complex is absorbed by another way. It's absorbed by the, by the amino acid transporters. So if we have a less status of zinc in the animal and put in an organic source, then we did not have the way uh, at the bottom by the normal transport mechanism, but we have the, uh, the other uh, absorption way by the amino acid transporters. And so we can um, get uh, sure that the animal um, gets the, the content of the trace element which is, um, which is needed. To show you the difference again, also in one picture, I, um, I write down what are the difference between organic trace elements and um, inorganic trace elements. Um, inorganic trace elements um, are, for example, oxides, sulfates or chlorides. Um, as I told you, this trace element absorbed just by the normal transport situation, transport uh, systems and um, the uh, competition with other trace elements is very high, as you see it here in the picture. Just one of the car can go through this passage and it's not, um, it's, uh, not, not in another way if we talk about iron and zinc, for example. Then we have the organic trace elements. Um, as, I, as I showed, these trace elements are bound on a whole protein or they are bound on different amino acids or they are bound to a specific amino acid. Um, the, the pro of this um, trace elements is that the absorption um, is by the amino acid transporters. So we have no competition with other trace elements. So as we learned, uh, we can 
we can handle the situation if we have uh, less of any trace element that we go and put in some organic trace element sources. But now the question is, the market, the market is full of different organic trace element sources. So we have to have a detailed look uh, which kind of trace element uh, we should need in an organic form because an organic trace element is not the same as another organic trace element. We have different points which are very important for the animal. So the first point is we have to choose an organic trace element source which is stable. That means um, this trace element source should be stable in every pH value. So if we have a source that's not um, stable in a low in, in a in a low pH level, then um, the the binding of uh, the protein and the trace element breaks down, and so we have not the effect that this trace element can go through the amino acid um, transport mechanism because the trace element is free and not more bounded on the protein complex. Then we have another side. Uh, we need also soluble, soluble trace elements because if we have a complex between a trace element and a protein which is not soluble, then uh, we did not have the chance that this trace element can be absorbed. The next point is a, is a absorbable uh, point. Any of uh, the trace elements which are in organic form has to be have to be absorbable. That means um, we have uh, different organic trace elements, but not every of the organic trace elements goes through the amino acid transporters. For example, glycine um, goes also through the metallotonin transporters, as we hear, um, um, which was also the way the, the inorganic trace element goes. And we have to uh, have a detailed look about um, on which trace or on which amino acid one trace element is bounded. So the next is um, the metabolic effect because um, if a trace element is not available, that means um, we can have the best amino acid um, which is bound on the trace element, but if this amino acid is not that much needed for the animal, then we can put in more and more of this um, amino acid bound on the trace element, but the animal cannot um, absorb it because this, this amino acid it is not needed um, in, in this amount. As you know, lysine, for example, is needed uh, in a higher amount than glycine. And to show this, I brought you this picture where you can see it. This was a study where different amino acids were put in the animal and um, then they looked how much of the of the input of the um, amino acids was taken up from the animal. And as you see, um, if we talk about lysine, you can feed a very high amount of lysine and this amount of lysine will always be absorbed because the animal needs a lot of lysine. Then instead of glycine because glycine is the smallest amino acid and this amino acid is not needed so much. So if you feed more and more of this glycine, um, this glycine will be in the animal, but will never be absorbed in this high amount as if you use lysine, for example. And uh, as I know from the from the practice, a lot of producers try to bound um, glycine through a trace element because glycine is the smallest amino acid and you can bound a lot of trace element on this um, protein uh, of uh, at this uh, amino acid. So now we heard a lot of um, uh, different uh, trace elements and um, the right bindings of this trace element through a protein, but at least I have to say it's not 
um, in the way that we can choose just one trace element, which which has a very good binding uh, on a protein, because it's not just one trace element, which is important for a good hoof health. It's the balance of all of these uh, trace elements, because as I told you f with the example of iron, um, you cannot put just one trace element in a very high amount and can expect that you will get uh, a good hoof stability because all of these trace elements standing um, in relationships through each other and you have to choose the right balance. So what was the task of Viloforce in the past? We searched for the best available trace elements. We balanced these trace elements under each other, and then we implemented a lot of various studies. The summary of the studies um, were, were the results which we put in one concept. This concept was called Marathon. So with Marathon, we have a very strong, good and balanced concept which um, included a lot of good organic trace elements and these trace elements have a very good balance between each other. For an example um, of one of these studies, I brought up this picture and you can see that we have uh, different points uh, which are tested in this study. At first, uh, I want to give you um, an overview about the BTD. BTD means nothing else than biotinodase. Bio biotinodase is very important because biotinodase means that we have a very high um, component of biotin. And as you know, biotin acts like cement between stones and biotin makes um, makes the horn more robust. So you can see that if we have a higher amount of biotinodase in the animals, um, we have um, a, a better effect on the horn quality. And as you see, for the organic source marathon, we have this higher amount of biotinodase. Then the next point which, um, which was uh, looked up was um, the KRT5. KRT5 are genes um, that were used um, from building of, of the carrageen. And if we have a less status of this KRT5, that means nothing else that then we have a reduced or, or a less horn growth. And if we have a less horn growth, then that means that we have a more stable horn. Also, we have uh, looked at special um, at special uh, indicators, inflammation indicators, and um, as you've seen, the inflammation indicators were reduced um, in the marathon group. So that means that we had a better function of the intestine in the marathon group. So at the end, uh, I wanted to show you our marathon concept. Um, our marathon concept included different minerals. Um, we have a mineral for um, younger cows, then we have a mineral for, for lactating cows, and we have um, a product which you can use on top through your um, normal used uh, mineral so that you don't have to change this. All of these uh, components are balanced uh, between each other and you have also the choice that you put in some biotin in these minerals. So this is uh, the variation with a plus under the first words. And as uh, Christo explained, biotin has a very high impact also on the horn quality and uh, the combination of all of these trace elements and the biotin will help you to uh, become a better horn stability by your animals. So now at the end, I want to give a summary um, of uh, our both uh, presentations and um, the topic uh, of this webinar was how we can influence the hoof stability. And uh, the answer of this question is that we cannot um, 
that we cannot control just one point and expect that the hoof quality will be better in the future. We have different points with um, with different meanings. So at first we have to check if the environmental um, for the hoof stability is good or not. Then we have to check if the if the way of trimming is good because the way of trimming can also um, um, can also uh, be good or bad for the hoof stability. Then, as Christo said, the feet is very important. We have to look at the feet and then we have to check if the if the basic feet um, and the and the concentrated feet is balanced or if we maybe have too much concentrated feet in because then we will get an, an acidosis and uh, as Christo showed this aspect is not so good and at least we have to check if the minerals are right in, in the ration and if we feed the right minerals and all of these uh, aspects are connected to each other and no of this aspect as aspects will work alone. So we always have to look at the whole status um, uh, to improve our hoof stability. So this was from my side. I want to say thank you for your attention and give the word to Jan. OK, well, Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, and also Risto for those uh, presentations. Very nice. Uh, we will go to the questions. Uh, only one so far. But anyway, this one uh, is for you, uh, Stephanie. It's uh, there are papers that show better absorption of glucine based organic trace minerals than methionine based organic trace minerals. How do you explain that? Yes, I can play. I can explain it just uh, in the way that maybe the animals had a very less uh, status of trace elements and um, that maybe the bound through the glycine was not strong enough so that this complex um, breaks down in the intestine and that the um, that the trace element, maybe the zinc, um, was uh, not more bounded on the glycine and goes just by the normal transport mechanism, so that uh, we don't talk um, about the about the complex anymore or, or the or the bounding anymore of the glycine and the and and the zinc. So um, I think that this complex breaks down and um, that uh, we are not talking more about an organic trace element just um, that, so that we are just uh, talking about uh, an inorganic trace element which uh, goes through the normal um, transport mechanism. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, it doesn't seem like there is uh, more questions for, for this uh, webinar today. I hope it's because uh, the two presenters did a very good job and gave you all the, the needed answers. Uh, at least for us, this has been a good experience and um, we thank you very much for participating in this uh, meeting. Uh, we hope that uh, you got some insight and knowledge about uh, the relation between uh, hoof health and nutrition. Um, and we will arrange more uh, questions in the future. Uh, well, excuse me, more uh, webinars in the future. And the next one, uh, Steffi, will be. So it'll be uh, the 25th of uh, November. So a bit more time than normal from us. Uh, we are slowing down a bit on webinars as we now get more and more out and meet each other physically. So the next one, feed allowance and essential nutrition will be on the 25th of November. So everybody, thank you for participating today. We hope to see you again in the future and bye and stay safe.